Hi everyone, welcome back to section 3, Matrices. This is part of our series on matrices and vectors for the book Climate Mathematics Theory and Applications. Today we're going to give a gentle introduction to matrices, and we're going to start by creating one. So we're first going to start by initializing a 5x5 five five matrix. And when I say a 5x5 five five matrix, what I'm indicating is that it has 5 rows and 5 columns. And we're not going to include any data in this matrix, but we're going to initialize it. So I run that. And below here in my output, here I know it was assigned to that object. And this is what it looks like. So we have 5 rows, 5 columns, and there are no data present because we didn't enter any data except for the NA term, not applicable term. And this is also called a square matrix since it has equivalent rows and columns. A matrix is an object composed of vectors that are of the same class and of the same length. Those are the two requirements necessary for a matrix. So we can have a matrix of numeric values, a matrix of character values, a matrix of string values. But we have to have the same class for all of our vectors, and our vectors have to be of the same length. Again, those are the defining attributes of a matrix. Let's create three numeric vectors consisting of five elements each. So VEC1 will say we want it to contain the numeric values from 1 to 5. VEC2, the numeric values from 6 to 10. VEC3, the numeric values from 11 to 15. So I have these three vectors that are independent on their own. And each vector is of five units or five numbers long. We're going to use the cbind function to bring these numeric vectors together into one single matrix. We'll call this matrix mat2, and using cbind, we list vec1, vec2, and vec3. And when we do that, and clicking on mat2, here we have vector1 containing the numbers from 1 to 5, vec2 containing the numbers from 6 to 10, and it goes on. The resultant matrix, I should note, is a 5 by 3 matrix where we have 5 rows and 3 columns. And we can check the dimensions of MAT2 if you don't believe me, and this is what R gives. The number 5 represents the number of rows, and 3 represents the number of columns. The way we specify our vectors in CBind is the order in which they're going to appear in the matrix. So I can specify VEC2 first, and VEC2 would appear in the first column of, of our matrix. But for the sake of continuity, we went in ascending order for this. Now let's say we want to extract the first column of the matrix. How do we do that? Well, we use bracket notation as one way of doing it. So on our previously created matrix, mat2, we're going to extract the first column. So we leave a space in the number of rows, right? Indicate a comma saying that we're finished with indicating the rows we want. Now we're going to move on to the column we want. So we want the first column, so we specify the number 1. And when I run that, here we have our extracted vector, because we have a one-column vector. And that represents what we extracted, VEC1. And this correlates up here to our first vector. Same thing, extract the second row of a matrix. So I want to extract the second row with all columns forming together that second row. So I specify the number 2 in the row uh, section of the brackets, and I leave the column bracket blank because I want to take out all the columns from it. And when I run that, here we have this. So we have for the second row, the columns forming that row, 2, 7, and 12. And when I look back at my matrix, here we have the second row, right? And these are the elements forming that second row. Now let's say we want to extract a specific element that's in the third row and second column of a matrix. Very simple, we just specify the number 3 in the row and number 2 for the column in the bracket notation. And I get one single element from the third row and second column and that single element is 8. Back in our matrix, here we have the third row, second column, and here we have eight. I'm going to add one more thing to this. What if we want to extract multiple 
observations. Well, we can do that by using the uh, colon notation. So let's say I want to take out all observations from the first to the third row. And that's how I do it. Here I have for row 1, the values 1, 6, and 11. Looking back at this, it works perfectly. We extracted the first row, second row, third row. So we use the colon notation to do if we want all the rows from 1 to 3 extracted from the matrix. Now let's examine extracting elements based on logical conditions. Now a logical statement results in a true or false condition. So in this case, we're going to use logical statements to extract elements that are greater than or equal to 6 on our previously created matrix MAT2. So this is the matrix we'll be using. So how do we specify this logical condition that we only want elements extracted from the matrix that are greater than or equal to 6? Well, we use two functions, the which function and the subset function. The subset function is going to deliver true or false values, specifying some type of condition we want. So we say for everything in our matrix, and this is a manual way of putting it out in our subset function, we use mat2, bracket notation, we want the first through the fifth row and the first through the third column. And if we look back at that, here we have our five rows and three columns, so we want the entire matrix. An equivalent way of writing this is to just leave the rows blank, the columns blank. That indicates we want the entire matrix to go under this uh, logic check. We use the greater than or equal to notation since we want elements that are greater than or equal to 6. And that is the subset function. And now we move to the which function. And when I specify this option in the which function, arrange.index equals true, it means I want to extract the elements position in the matrix. So I'm going to take out the row and column position of the matrix exactly where it returns a true value. We'll call this index 1. And when I open up index 1 over in our global environment, here we have all of our element locations where there was a true value returned from the subset function. So in row 1, column 2, we had an element that was greater than 6. Row 1, column 2, oh look at that, 6. 6 is greater than or equal to 6. In row 2, column 2, row 2, column 2, 7 is greater than 6. So this takes out the row and column position from the matrix. So we can then indicate in a separate vector that we're going to call list 1, the elements that we want to pull from the matrix. So I use bracket notation again. Here I have mat2. And since index 1 is just a 10 by 2 vector, with each column vector indicating either the row position or the column position, I can put the entire index 1 matrix into the square bracket. And when I run that, and open up list 1, or actually print list 1, These are all the values that fit that logical check. So we've obtained the original values. We've put them into a vector. That vector is called list1. Now let's construct a matrix showing the extracted elements position in mat2 and its value. We're going to call this matrix subset1. Here we have subset1. Let's refamiliarize ourselves with the cbind function. It can also work when you have a you can also put a matrix into the cbind function. So we use index 1, our matrix. We're going to bind it with our vector list 1. When I do that, here we have a newly created matrix, subset 1, that contains the row, the column position, and the value from the original matrix for all elements greater than or equal to 6. So to recap, we use two different functions the which function and the subset function. The subset function was where we specified our logical condition and it returned a series of true or false values. And the which function is how we got the, uh, the true values position in the matrix. 
So we extracted those position values using the which function. We return the true or false values using the subset function. And let's practice this one more time. Let's extract elements from our same matrix, mat2, that are either less than 5 or, so we're specifying an or condition, greater than or equal to 9. So we have two logical statements. We want the elements that are less than 5, or we want the elements that are greater than or equal to 9. We'll create a new object, index2, which will contain, by way of the which statement, the row and column positions of the true values returned by the subset statement. So in our subset function, we're going to put all values of our mat2 matrix in this logical check. We want to return a true value if our element is less than 5, or, and this is how we indicate or, if our element is greater than or equal to 9. This is our subset function. We've embedded it into our which function, and now returning to the which function, we want the row and column positions where there were a true value. And this is what the arrange.index equals true does. It gives us the row and column positions from the original matrix. Let's open up index 2 in our global environment. So we have 11 elements from our mat2 matrix that prove true when either of those conditions were correct. So in row 1, column 1, 1 is less than 5 for sure. In Let's look at observation number 10 in our index 2 matrix. In row 4, column 3, row 4, column 3, 14 is greater than or equal to 9. So to recap, we use the subset function to return true values and false values, but we want to extract those true values if our element was less than 5 or, specifying this notation, greater than or equal to 9. Using the which function, we returned a matrix of row and column positions for those true values. And now we're going to use the same process above. Putting in our row and column positions in mat2, we're going to extract those values into a vector called list2, and we're going to use cbind so that we can see the row and column position of the true values and the value itself in one single matrix called subset2. So here is subset2, gives us the row and column position by way of the which function, and list2 gives us the actual element itself from mat2, our matrix, that tells us the value that satisfied the conditional logic check.